This is the March 15th, 2021 Design Review Committee, and we'll start with our roll call agenda. Kelly Baker. Present. Susan Besser. Present. Brian Laster. Present. Nick Mann, I do not see. No. Lisa Marquardt. Present. Mary Pierce. Present. Ken Scalf. Present. Kathy Worthington. Present. And Jim Roberts, present. Now I'd like to entertain a motion to approve resolution 2021-41, a resolution declaring that the Design Review Commission shall meet on March 15, 2021 and conduct its essential business by electronic means rather than being required to gather a quorum of the members physically present in the same location because it is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of COVID-19. Is there a motion? So moved, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Is there a second? Second, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, then let's vote. Please respond when I call your name. Kelly Baker. Aye. Susan Besser. Aye. Brian Laster. Aye. Lisa Marquardt. Aye. Mary Pierce. Aye. Ken Scalf. Aye. Kathy Worthington. Aye. And Jim Roberts, aye. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak, the meeting will be a virtual meeting. The purpose of the meeting will be to conduct a design review workshop. No decisions on applications will be made at the meeting. The public may call into the conference meeting and listen at 312-626-6799, meeting ID 979-9632-6706, passcode 378-473. The public may email comments and to planning intake at franklintn.gov to be provided in full to the commission and included in the minutes but not read aloud in their entirety during the meeting. Emailed comments will be accepted until 4 p.m. on the day before the meeting. The meeting video will be available for public viewing 24 hours following the meeting at the City of Franklin YouTube account. The DRC is a subcommittee of historic zoning. The meeting is informal and designed to guide applicants through the process of obtaining a Certificate of Appropriateness or COA for projects within the city's historic districts in light of the historic district design guidelines. Applicant participation in DRC meetings is voluntary but highly recommended for complex renovations, additions, or new construction. Changes made or suggestions taken by the applicant based on discussion with the DRC are the applicant's choice but the DRC makes no representation as to whether any changes or suggestions made during the meeting will be approved by the voting body, which is the Historic Zoning Commission. There are four items on the afternoon agenda. When your item is called, please introduce yourself and generally describe your item in about three to five minutes. Screen sharing permissions will be limited to staff, so please ask staff to pull up pages of your item as needed. Please focus on the specific points of your project that you want DRC to discuss. Once you have provided a general review, staff will provide comment on specific points for DRC to discuss as well. I will then ask for a roll call comments from the commission and any final comments from staff and the committee members afterwards. Our first item is discussion of alterations, which are the fences and walls at 150 Franklin Road, Gary Batson applicant. So applicants, you, if you'll go ahead and make your comments, and I think we are, uh, we're certainly down to the fences and walls on the property. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Jim Cross. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you, sure. Okay, I'm calling in this time and I'm not on Zoom, so I wasn't sure. I don't, uh, I'll let Chris Wood also comment, but I don't know that we have any additional things to add other than uh, we have a, a consultant uh, defense systems that, that's consulting with the school that uh, we will have at the next meeting a, a recommendation from this consultant about the, what the, the desired height of the fence is to meet the uh, security uh, measures that we're trying to take with this fence. Again, it's not a decorative fence, it's for security purposes. So that, that's really the only thing that we'll have to add to our presentation that we, that we already have so far. Okay, all right, thank you. 
Mr. So, Chairman, this is Dwight Kaiser. Uh, I'd like to just say a couple of brief comments. Amanda, would you mind pulling up the three perspectives that uh, we created for the last uh, the last meeting? Sure, not a, I'm happy to do that. Just a moment. <clears throat> Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. It's a little harder to tell from him. I think that next one is it's stalling just a little bit. Okay, here we go. Not the first one? Is that the first one? That's the second one. So if you go up one page, go up one if you don't mind. Okay, I'm sorry about that. It, it, um, it, told you. That's okay. it went too far, yeah. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to point these out that uh, based on the previous design review committee, um, our team was asked to produce um, perspectives uh, for consideration at the vote, which is, this is the, the first of three. Um, it's a uh, combination of what, SketchUp and- Yeah, SketchUp, Lumion. Other, other types and, of software that allowed us to take actual views and, and create that look. Um, if you would just skip through all three of them there. Um, I, I want you to, to please consider that uh, the, the fence that we've located here is roughly 25 feet off the back of the sidewalk. Um, I think these three images pretty much convey the feeling of openness and not obstructing the view to the actual historic um, Cox House. Um, you know, we've worked very closely uh, with staff and, and from a design standpoint to hopefully come up with a design that is historically accurate for our community. Um, there are precedent images uh, that we've taken from uh, around the city of Franklin. And quite honestly, I know that uh, based on what historic guidelines say for a three foot fence, there are numerous uh, examples where you know, that doesn't hold true that were built prior to the, the uh, current guidelines that even conflict in some regards with the city of Franklin. They're not always in lockstep with each other. Um, given that this is a, a, a school and particularly since it is a school for very young children from uh, kindergarten through age four, security is very important to the client, obviously. Um, and and that's, that's part of this major makeover that, that we're trying to create. Uh, a while back, a comment was made that this six foot fence was gonna be in your face. And I don't believe that is the case. If we look at the, uh, the uh, photographs that we also submitted um, uh, along with the Amore School of Design or the Old Amore, that's I think part of this package. Yeah. Um, you know, that is a fence that is right along on the sidewalk. There is a difference between that configuration and something that's pushed back 25 feet and or more. And we really, really would appreciate your consideration um, in our proposal. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer it, but uh, hopefully we have put our best foot forward in, in uh, addressing and being sensitive to our guidelines and to our city and to the client and end users need in this case. Thank you. Thanks. Gary or Chris, do you have any comments on this? Yes, sir. Okay, Amanda. Thank you all. I appreciate the applicant's comments. Um, I have nothing additional to add to my previous statements. Um, this is a, a special site, as we all know. It is a National Register property, and um, you know it, it has a lot of presence here on Franklin Road. I certainly appreciate the applicants' um, considerations and comments related to the proposal. Um, my role here is to relay what the Historic District Design Guidelines and the Zoning Ordinance um, recommend and require um, as far as fencing and walls go along this corridor and the recommendation for any front yard, which is within 20 feet of the front face of the wall of the historic home to be three feet in height or less. So as uh, proposed, the application does not meet the design guidelines nor does it meet the zoning ordinance requirements. 
except for the athletic field, which isn't shown in the renderings outright, but the athletic field is to the right of where this, um, this post is rendered on that, that empty air, open space area between here and the river. Um, that athletic field fence per zoning ordinance can be six feet in height um, due to the nature of the, um, the fence, um, what it's proposed to do, um, screen athletic fields. Um, the applicant would require um, issuance of a variance from the Board of Zoning Appeals for any fencing uh, proposed um, to the Historic Zoning Commission for this property with the exception of the athletic field if, if approved by the Historic Zoning Commission. And I'm happy to comment any further if you have any questions. I uh, also do want to note that the applicant did streamline the design of the, the perimeter fence, um, which I do think is very helpful um, in moving forward. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, before we ask for individual commissioners' uh, comments, let's let's do this. We've got we've got a fence that runs along the north property, north side of the property that goes behind the school. Um, and, and we've talked about that a little bit before. And then we've got the athletic fence and that fence that goes around the south portion of the property. Does anybody have any comments about those areas of fence? And if not, we'll just limit the discussion to the area in the front, which I think was the biggest concern, if that's, if that's all right with everybody. If anybody, speak up if, that's, if you wanna talk about other parts of this. I wanna to try to narrow down the discussion. Okay, well, let's talk about the, let's talk about the front then. And um, I tell you what, I'll do something completely out of the ordinary. I'm gonna go from the bottom up, uh, reading the name. So Kelly doesn't have to be the first one to respond. Uh, so I'll, let me just make a couple of comments and, and ask the question of Dwight and Gary: uh, are, Is is that uh, perspective from Franklin Road, is that road bed going to be raised or is the property in the front going to be graded down? So it'll, it'll be a flush. Currently there is a, a ditch along Franklin Road right there. Right, right. Yeah. That's where the construction's going on. I, I know that, right. but historically it's been, it's been a slight slope upward there. So because that driveway that I'm looking at right now, there's a, an incline down uh, when you come out of there. Um, and it looks right now like it's going to be pretty pretty flat with Franklin Road. I, I think there's still, it's going to be still some grade change between the the drive coming out of BGA and Cook to Franklin Road. I, I think to, to specifically answer your question, there's probably six to eight, six to 12 inches of grade change from the base of the wall to the sidewalk, which will be lower to just promote drainage, obviously. Okay. Okay, and then, um, and I guess, so, so the, the road bed at Franklin Road is going to remain roughly the same as it is now. Is that, that what you understand? From the design of, of drawings that we have seen for the city of Franklin, they're probably within six inches of existing, plus or minus. Okay. And then I, my only other comment is I understand the security issue. I have no, I have no problem because we looked at, uh, at least I, I, I did, and I think others have too. I've looked at the Elmore property. That that fence um, that you're proposing is virtually the same as as I measured where that Elmore sign is. It's virtually the same thing. It was it was 16 inches on that brick wall at Elmore, and it's uh, four and a half feet a fence above that with the sign, with the sign there too. Yes, so um, I, I don't, as I said in a previous meeting, I have no problem based on the security that you're trying to achieve in having that six foot wall shown here, which includes the masonry wall. So that's my, that's my two cents. Um, Kathy Worthington. You're, you're muted, Kathy. Um, no, I don't have anything else to add. The only thing with, when I look at O'More, the, the fences right up on the sidewalk, and then the house is up on a hill. 
So it's a different perspective. So it's more in line. We have more of a straight line view from the street of BCG. Okay, Ken Scal. I, I uh, echo your comments, Jim. Um, I think that um, the 25 foot setback is going from a perspective standpoint is going to reduce some of the um, monumentality of it, if that's the right word. As that's you a good word. Sidewalk. That's a good word. Yeah. So, so I, 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 I concur. I, I, you know, I, it's, it's a special circumstances that we probably would not consider elsewhere, but I think, you know, in this scenario, um, BJ is committed to this location and, and, uh, these are great improvements. All right, thank you. Mary Pierce. Uh, basically, uh, I agree with what Ken said, and I think they are guidelines and historic preservation, it all depends. And I do not believe we are precedent that we would not be happy to live with. This is an elementary school and it's a tall historic building, which gives some forgiveness and the setback. So I, I don't have a problem. Lisa Marquardt. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think our, our guidelines uh, did not really take into consideration that this, um, that this would be the scenario uh, that would come in front of us. And so again, it is a unique scenario. One of the previous applications uh, for a fence that was presented to the commission not too long ago uh, was also suggested to look at a fence in historic uh, Franklin. And one of the fences that might be helpful to look at uh, are at the brownstones. We have, there's a fence there, uh, both on First and Church, as well as on First Avenue and Second Avenue that are six feet or above. Certainly that's a different situation because the brownstones are not a contributing historic property. So it's different from this, but um, in this situation, I think, uh, the 25 foot setback and uh, the unique circumstances call for an exception. Thank you. Uh, Brian Laster. Mr. Chair, at this point, I'm just listening and learning. I do have one question where security is concerned and the gates for ingress and egress. Uh, will they remain closed during school hours? And if, if they're closed, how do uh, parents and other people get in and out. To uh, the intent that is after drop off, they would be would be closed, and there would be through the security uh, consultant probably a, either a keypad, a call box that goes to the front office, just like they've got on the door right now uh, to enter the facility, and then to exit. You, since you already are on the, approved to be on the property, the exit would be a magnetic loop that senses the car uh, and would open the gate. Thank you. BPA is committed to maintaining their, we'll call it the traffic cop, uh, you know, in the morning and the evening to help with, with cars entering and exiting uh, at those drop off and pick up times. So obviously at early morning and the end of the day, the auto gates will, will remain open as they're coming in and then you have security there on site. As Chris said, after those hours or preceding those hours, they would be closed and only uh, operated by a control device. We haven't designed the system yet, obviously, but we would. Um, the residential gate in the, uh, in the middle um, Amanda, if you wouldn't mind flipping just to that next uh, slide, please. That that this this is an actual eye level sitting in a car. I, I want everyone to understand that that this perspective particularly. That uh, man gate would be always closed. 
um, unless there was some event that might be going on where it would be open, but it would maintain, it would be in a locked uh, condition at, at all times, unless it was specifically open for a specific reason. Hope that answers. Thank you. That, yeah, that, thank you. Appreciate it. Brian, anything else? That's all, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, Susan Besser. Uh, I would really like to not comment on the height until we have something from the security company. Um, the six feet, I think, I would prefer that it would be lower. But I think really until we have that information, um, I don't think we have what we need to really make this decision. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Baker. Uh, I would concur with Susan. You know, my concern has to do with the height, and I would like to have that information from the security professionals so that way we can feel comfortable with going against guidelines if that's what we decide to do. I'm also very mindful that while this is a special circumstance and I agree, I don't think it is setting a precedent as Ms. Pierce stated, we will have another special circumstance arise at some point. It's, it's just that will happen. And this will be an example that will be pulled up in those situations. And so we wanna make sure we get this right because this is going to this is going to set the trend for other special circumstances. Okay, um, Amanda, do you have any other comments? No, I don't. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Have any comments, staff, uh, commissioners? The yeah. only comment. Oh, excuse me, Mary. Go, okay, Mary. Go ahead, Mary. Go ahead. I was just going to say, as a as um, a zillion years ago, a parent at this school, I don't really believe this is going to provide an enormous amount of security uh, from day to day, because there are just people coming and going, parents coming and going during the day. But oftentimes, the school lets all the children out on the campus, and that is the time that I think it would really, really matter for security. Um, if there's a playtime, and I would imagine the school will get smart at asking, uh, you know, the coming and goings to be in concert with that. So that would be my comment. I just remember many times of them all out. Thank you. Well, let's don't forget also with the streetscape expansion up and down Franklin Road, the walking traffic is going to build exponentially when festivals and when pilgrimage are in place. And if you don't have some kind of, I, I'm sure that's also a part of this is that people do not go on the property to at, at, during those events uh, that, that don't need to be there. So I think we need to all keep that in mind as well. So if there's any other, if there's no other questions, I think uh, we're ready for the next item and we thank you gentlemen. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just one final comment yeah. Yeah. regarding this application is the idea that um, a higher fence for the sports field that is adjacent to a lower fence because of the limitations that, that we're speaking of is going to, in my opinion, look very odd. So that... remember where that athletic field is, it's, it's way bit, it's a bit lower than what this area in the front that we've been discussing is. So it oh. really drops off down there. So very much so. Oh, it does. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks to all and, and uh, we're, we're ready for our next item. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thanks. you. Uh, this is the, uh, our next item is discussion of demolition at 211 Second Avenue South. Amanda McCrary. Hey guys. Hello. Uh, so um, taking into consideration what we discussed last week, um, I did add a page to this, but I did want to touch base on a couple of things real quick as we go through. Amanda, can we go to the next slide? So one thing, when I was thinking back through this from a structural, our biggest, we have two big problems. One is that we're a foot over in the neighbor's yard and we have a really tight space to work with. And the second one is we have a structural issue. 
for sure with the CMU walls and the roof structure that it's tying to. And then on top of that too, is this idea of rehabilitation. I know that's been asked as what's the cost of rehabilitation. So just going through these pictures one more time to kind of jog your memory. This front view, those gates are not historic. They were made by the owner of the property in 1998. He's been a long-term resident of downtown Franklin. Um, and he very, very vividly remembers making those gates. So there's CMU walls on either side, the left side and the right side, as you're looking at the front. The gate portion, like I said, is not historic. And the rear portion has lean-to off the back. And it also has, you can see in that top right picture, a haphazard mix of materials. That's actually some metal roofing that is on the structure. That wall does not have any studs. And so the structure of this is CMU wall on one side, CMU wall on the other, and then the roof. And so our CMU is severely compromised. On the left side, it's heaving. So it's kind of pulling away, it's cracking at a joint this direction. And then on the right side, it's cracking through the blocks. So a, a good structural um, basic is if we've got cracks along a mortar line, those can typically be repaired. If they're cracked through blocks, it's something more substantial. And that's the situation we have. So we have cracking and failing. The blocks are caving in on the right side. And on the left side, we are cracked at a mortar joint, but it's completely horizontal. So that's where we're getting this like hinge heave effect. You can actually see it a little bit in that picture. It's hard to pick up because of the paint colors. But um, so with this, we've got the CMU. That's the, the top is the right side of it. And the left, you can see the crack. It, that's where that hinge point is. As far as we know, the CMU walls are not on a proper foundation. So they're not properly secured to the ground. There is no slab on the inside. And then the roof structure, I think that might be the next slide. That's the rear, the rear is a mess. So the roof structure has some um, hinge moments as well. You can see in that top right picture, it's bowing. So, um, you know, we have some, some pretty substantial structural and then we have some deterioration of the components like the fascia bores. We do not have, you can see the daylight in the bottom left picture. We do not have any soffit covers. Um, coming through. So we've got some deterioration, some of our rafter tails. I think the biggest thing for me is when it comes to trying to rehabilitate it from an owner standpoint, you're rehabilitating something that's on someone else's property. So that's, you know, a challenge. You can see in that, that middle left picture with the roof, you can, that's the actual metal roof that's on the rear wall. So you can see that four foot panel, there are no studs there. Yes, right there. So there's no studs at that portion. So typically when we're working in older houses and we've got to beef up a roof structure, we sister those. So we have a roof structure come in and we sister it with either another two by six or an LVL to really help solidify that load. But in this case, if we had to do that to deal with the bows, I don't think the CMU walls can handle it because it's already got tremendous deterioration. And so without it having a proper footing that you can't chase those loads down, I don't know how you rehabilitate the structure. Michael Lee and I had some additional discussions after our meeting, and I just don't feel that there's any way you would pretty much be taking the whole thing down because it's CMU. We can't slide it or move it because it's wood. We can't sister up some wood in between for some wood framing materials because it is CMU and they're not properly structural to a proper foundation. And we've got all this movement in Boeing. I just don't know what we can rehabilitate. So we don't have, I say all that to say, we did provide some sketches and some ideas of what some thoughts are going back, but we don't really have a cost of rehabilitation because the cost would be to have to take it down and rebuild it. And if that's what we're doing, do we really want to take it down and rebuild it out of CMU? So I guess that's kind of the big discussion of, you know, is it viewed as a contributing structure and, and that part, as well as we have substantial structural deterioration. So you can go to the next slide. Oh, that's it. Do you, did you happen to be able to have that other one, Amanda? There we go. So um, from a site 
plan perspective, we have the existing house. And then what we would like to do is do a modest garage off the back. Uh, we would like to separate it off that side yard. Let's get to the proper five foot side yard setback that we have. And we'd like to pull it back a little bit away from the house, enough to get some turning out of the garage that we can pull out into the street. There's an existing driveway there. We have an existing curb cut. Um, so that portion is the same. We're definitely gonna look at doing a new driveway as I think this one is being shared currently with the neighbor next door while they're under construction. Um, but this is just a very, very basics uh, looking at a gable structure with a shed off the side. We, you know, that again, this is a long-term resident for downtown Franklin. So this is not um, like some of the people that I've worked with that are new to downtown or development type of property. So for this particular client, we are really are trying to make sure that we can get the existing structure demolished before we do a full-fledged design project for what this new garage is because there isn't a cost associated with that. But I think part of it too is um, he's a designer himself and wants to see this eyesore gone and have a blank canvas for us to uh, be able to look at it. But we're looking at something similar to this. I did do the uh, building coverages as requested. Uh, again, it's a huge lot. So the existing building coverage is about 14%. Um, and if we were to do a larger one car garage like this will be at 15%. So we're, we're nowhere close to any kind of maximum building coverage just due to the lot size. The owner, um, if you've ever been back in that lot, it's beautiful in the backyard. It feels like a little pocket park back there. Um, and so we definitely want to retain that feeling. So we don't want the garage to get too massive or pull too far away from the house because we really want that backyard to feel like it does now. It's a little oasis inside the city. And that's pretty much what I have. Okay, Amanda. Tagging in the other Amanda. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make Rose. sure. Okay. I know. It's a party. It's an Amanda party. Yes. So um, thank you very much, uh, Amanda McCurry. I really appreciate the additional information today. Um, my suggestion would be to um, write a narrative that, that relates that information that you shared today, um, because I do think that that would be very helpful in supplementing the application that you have on file. Um, the, uh, the Historic Zoning Commission needs to consider information in front of them, and any uh, information you add at DRC that's not part of the application is just not part of the application. So I do think that helps me as a preservation planner who's charged to, you know, be very mindful and careful about making recommendations for the, the demolition of, of contributing structures. I do think that this building was considered contributing um, because of its age. Um, I know that it's not uh -oh. contemporary to the house and I know it's not contemporary to a lot of our accessory structures, but it is um, contributing in age. And I think that um, our charge at the time that we updated the National Register District um, information for downtown was to try to take particular care with our accessory structures because there is a strong desire by lots as they, they move in, like Ms. McCurry mentioned, to, um, to remove those for something larger. And we wanna make sure that we are um, mindful of our res um, residential historic resource building stock. So with that, I, I do think that there is a lot more information shared today that would help staff support the proposal. Um, but just keep in mind that what you see on the screen right now is conceptual. It couldn't be tied to any approval that the Historic Zoning Commission may or may not make in relation to this. This was just something that will help give you an idea of the applicant's intent moving or the, the owner's intent moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Kelly Baker, I'm going to go back to you right off the bat now for comments. Well, so I, I really appreciate what both Amanda's have said. Um, I've thought a lot about this outbuilding since our meeting last week. And I think that <clears throat> that's one of the things that's really important to me as a commissioner. I know my fellow commissioners probably feel the same way is that whenever we see a proposal for or an application for demolition, we need time to really sit with that because you know, this isn't a contributing building based on the most recent survey. And, 
you know, we have to ask ourselves, are all contributing buildings worth saving? Is a CMU building built, you know, just over 50 years ago, one that we need to fight for preserving? And, and so, you know, having had a week or so to think about it and kind of reflect on the pictures that have been presented, and plus this additional information, hopefully the narrative that will be presented at the meeting, I, I could feel comfortable with demolition at this point. Um, but it, like I said, it did take me quite a bit of time because that's a heavy decision for us to make. Thank you, Susan Besser. Um, I think the, the thing that for me is hard is that, you know, you could, if it were, if the building were a frame structure, I think it would be one thing, you know, uh, to move it. But I think there's so many issues with trying to move the building and it being on the um, adjacent property that I've, I've really had a hard time getting my head wrapped around trying to save the building. So I think that I could, you know, support uh, demolishing the building. Thank you. Brian Lester. Uh, Amanda McCreary, I'd like to say to you, thank you for coming back to the board. Uh, the homeowners, you can tell they've taken great care of the place and Second Avenue has such great architecture throughout the entire street. And it's one of my favorite houses. I've often admired it. Uh, I think from the information that we have, uh, it would be an improvement to actually remove that building and replace it with something similar to what you're proposing. So I, I have no problem with, uh, with demolition. Thank you. Lisa Marquardt. Uh, only to say that um, based on what, uh, Amanda Rose said regarding the expanding the narrative uh, in previous demolition submissions that we've had, which are are obviously something that that uh, we look at from a, a very high standard of proof. Um, it seems to me that the uh, opinion of a structural engineer, which would provide an objective opinion about um, the benefits of or the possibility or costs of rehabilitation, all the things that that already the applicant has articulated. Uh, it is helpful, however, to have the opinion of an objective expert. That, that's what I would say. All right, Mary Pierce, thanks. Um, I it just appears to me, and, and I'm certainly don't know for sure, but um, it appears to me that maybe this was one time a frame building and someone concreted up the sides uh, because it was in rack and ruin, because at one point uh, this was a gravel pit for the city of Franklin. Um, so with the information provided and with, with my belief that a lot of um, architectural integrity of this building has uh, long been compromised. Um, I don't take lightly demolishing something in the historic district, but I think this is one of the situations where I can support that. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Ken Scout. Yes, sir. I, I concur with the comments earlier that Kelly and Brian made. I, I do not see the need to employ a structural engineer. You've got a licensed architect that's on this team. It's made this determination. Uh, so that's just, that's all I have to add. Kathy Worthington. I concur with um, comments, particularly with Brian and Amanda Rose and, and Amanda McCreary to, um, consider a demo and improvement. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and I have no uh, problem with everything that's already been been said. I, I'm like Ken Scalp. I'm not sure that I see the need for a structural engineer based on the comments that Amanda McCreary has made with the cracks in the CMU and the fact that the building has no foundation. Um, so that's key. Plus the fact that I think the big thing is it's not fully on the current homeowner's property. So that's, uh, and it needs that relief. Amanda McCreary, I would suggest, even though it's a concept that you show the new, just a rough footprint of the new building uh, in relation to the current building. 
when okay. it comes back before us, just so we have that in idea in mind, knowing that we're not approving that. Right, and we're, we're not least, ready for that either. I, I, I understand that, and but at least we know kind of what we'll be talking about going forward. Thank and, you, and I think the narrative is a great idea. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah, I do. I do too. That's a that's a great idea, Amanda Rose. Um, any other comments by anybody? All right. We're good, Amanda McCurry. Thank you very much for this today. Yes, thank you. Okay, Thanks, guys. We're, we're now ready for item three, wherever I can find it. I'm getting warm. Here we go. Discuss addition and alterations at 212 Lewisburg Avenue, Don Burke. Welcome, Don. Hi. Hi there. How are you? Fine. Hope you're well. I am. I'm uh, I'm COVID free. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want to start, Amanda, or do you? Uh, no, you go. You go ahead and start. Okay. Uh, we are bringing our project back to you for a second look with some new information that has um, arrived to us via Albania and a rendering service there. Um, the uh, the initial conversation I had with the Binkleys after. Uh, after our last meeting was relative to, you know, what they were hoping to achieve out of the house and what they needed square footage wise to be happy with the, with the development they can, they can do on this property. And we went back and we relooked at a lot of the, uh, um, the guidelines and, and, and we're trying to understand um, the implications of what view shed would, uh, would add to the interpretation of, um, by the board of what was possible on the property. And the last time we focused on the elevations, we still have those, we can look at those again. Uh, we've made some modifications to those to try and help mitigate the view shed issues. You know, obviously last time there were some aesthetic, um, you know, there were opinions of, of, about the aesthetics that were, you know, a lot of the board members expressed a, a concern for. Um, the Binkleys are actually fairly content with the design, the neighbors have all uh, offered some support, the immediate neighbors have offered support for the design as it exists. And uh, so this time we're bringing back the conversation, we wanna talk about the view shed. So I've prepared this site plan um, that is based on uh, an aerial view from uh, Williamson County maps with the placement of the building on there and also backed up with a lot of photographs uh, that we have made on the property realizing that you know this is actually quite a difficult lot to see behind and also with the lot lines showing the adjacency of the building how it addresses the street how the neighboring buildings bookending it on either side address the street uh, it's an attempt to sort of explain with the lot size and shape why the design had a tendency to move out towards the north west edge of the property and how this happened. So in this site plan, what you're looking at is two levels. The lighter gray is representing the elements of the building that would be within the view shed of the upper portion of the roof. And then the, the darker shade is covering the areas, yes, there where um, that would be visible had there, were there no foliage or any obstacles to seeing at the fences or trees or the hillside that this is on. This is actually not a steep site, but it does have a grade change from the street level up to the house. The house kind of sits up probably three or four feet above the grade of the street. Uh, it's just a gentle rise, um, but it does affect your perspective view. So um, there is the natural grade, the trees and the existing fences that stand in the way of the view of what would be a screen porch, which would also, also be a very translucent object as well. So it would be more like a porch. It is a porch, it's a screen porch. That's the element that you're seeing in dark gray. So if we move to, uh, we can move um, back and forth. Before we move on, do you yeah. mind clarifying, are these considered the light gray? The light one, gray two, is stuff three. that's, yes. And that's stuff that's visible okay. above, the, above the first floor plane. Okay. Um, the, the roof that, um, the, the first obstruction that you're seeing on the north side there is an existing roof that projects off the main volume of the house. That roof's ridge line is high enough that it blocks the view plane of the lower level addition. So the only re the reason why you're seeing dark gray in there is because that's the only portion of building that you can see beyond the view shed of the lower roof's ridge, highest ridge. 
The second line, upper level view shed, is from the higher part of the house's ridge and the chimney mass that's on the, on the original mass of the house, the big mass. Well, the, the wings were original to the house, but they did have a lower pitched roof. So to see over, to see over that, these were the elements that were visible from there. Is that, does that make enough sense? I would think it, that, that we're looking, you'll, you'll see it when you see, I think when the 3D images will kind of make that all kind of clear. Um, yeah, so, so we're looking at a photograph from the street now, and then I think we can look at uh, the 3D images. That's, a, that's, that's more of a corner view from where the, uh, the, map, the map that I showed you earlier, that is the corner of the property line, and uh, the Powell's property to the north of here has a significant amount of plantings blocking the view. So we included another photograph from another five feet down the road, uh, down the sidewalk. That's the middle. Can we go right about there? Yeah. So that would be looking kind of, kind of straight on another five or so feet down uh, Lewisburg Pike to the rear addition. And you can see, and, and maybe, maybe um, you know, you all see what's going on, right? That image is probably the better one, but you see the lower roof on the wing on the side there. The reason why the map is showing one line going over that is to show that that view shed blocks the view of, uh, of the lower portion of the building. And the only reason we darkened out the, the, the gray portion north of that is that that screen porch extends out uh, beyond that. And it is, like I said, a translucent building, a screen on both sides. It's completely see-through. It's just a colonnade. It could be a porch. If it didn't have a screen on it, it'd just be a porch. Um, the higher ridge that we're seeing there is what's blocking the view of the, of the second level addition, the extension of the back. So uh, if we can, uh, Amanda, go to, the, go to the, the 3D image. So you can see here, you see that large chimney mass it was not met with a whole lot of favorable reaction last time. It's still on there, uh, but we do have a newer rendition, a newer view that I was able to extract from our renderer in Albania uh, over the weekend uh, that shows us addressing that by removing the, the masonry mass and pushing what you see over. Uh, you could see a little bit of the second story, story extension here uh, beyond the beyond the roof overhang of the main level, we've pushed that back another two feet as well to get that further out of the view shed. Now, this isn't a totally accurate model. Uh, there's a lot of things lacking about it, but it does do a pretty good job of massing the situation. Um, Amanda, do you want to do you want to go to the and then from this side, we you know we really can't see the addition at all. You can see some you can see some rafter tails. From the addition of the second level over this but i mean in this this might be the one area where you would actually see through the trees because there aren't as many plantings in this area and it's possible that under the canopy of trees you you wouldn't see uh the addition at all um so hey Don, yes. i have to reshare because the other images you provided were um, jpegs so um do you have anything else you'd like to comment on and related to this pdf file no, I'm not sure the right file now. that I sent you last time. If you want to access your uh, previous elevations from the previous DRC meeting or the images that I shared with you this morning, yeah, go for it. Okay, do you want to pull up the elevations? Yeah, I can share them from my screen too, if you'd like. I have them right here. I okay. just can't show the rendering. Well, the let's look at the plan. Let me today until um, I reshare. I see, I see. Well, let's look at this floor plan then. Um, I think everyone's probably on the same page. We have, you know, uh, what you're, what you're, what you would be seeing. And I'm not even sure to, to how much of an extent. I think the fireplace mass was probably one of the more visible things. I'm not even really sure that over the existing five foot fence that comes out between right in the middle of the dining room windows. That existing five foot fence might not be legal today, but it's still holding up pretty well. I imagine they would keep it. Um, I don't know, would it be? Uh, it, it is 20 feet past the front of the house. So 
It could be that a higher fence could be to maintain, but if you were to take it down, we probably ask that you place it in a different location because it does intersect fenestration in a way that would not be um, historically appropriate. Uh -huh. Yeah, because it's between windows. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe it would be better to move it back behind the windows. But the height and the style would be would be fine. Acceptable. Okay. Um, well, you know, I mean. With that, with that in tow, you know, as far as a view shed goes, you know, we our point is that the neighbors approve of the design on both sides, and um, I think I believe uh, Chris is on the line here, but um, I don't know if they've spoken to the new neighbors in the rear. They were, uh, I believe, those are brand new neighbors that have just bought in, but I think the belief is that we could get support from the neighbors, the adjacent neighbors for this design. Um, the objective of this, let me, let me clarify something here about this plan, is that we're not trying to obstruct any side elevations. We would like to design something that um, is very transparent and easy for you to see through to the old house. And if we look at a rear elevation, um, yeah, if we're just looking at these two elevations, you should be able to see on the lower right hand corner of the lower plant, the lower elevation here, the existing exterior still be, will, would still be expressed inside the house. And so would the rear elevation of logs, you know, uh, and, and then the, the, the basket weave pattern brick that was used for the patio in the back would just be elevated one foot to a new sunken living room inside the house that extends to the outside. So we're trying to, you know, the owners have lived here for a long enough time that they have a collective memory of the site. They want to preserve what it was existing about it in spirit too. And some of that involves having that old patio that was out there that was once a screen porch now become a more enclosed space for the expansion of their house into a heated and cooled area and use the same materials that were reminiscent of the old screen porch as the flooring for that room. So that's just, and that, that's just going to extend through that lower space and out into a screen porch. So, you know, there are subtle things that are going on that are in the, in the effort to, to, to support the idea of historic preservation in a micro level on, on the actual property, not necessarily aimed at the community in general, but for the house to be preserved as best possible by leaving the exterior materials as they are expressed on the inside of the house. And uh, so we tried to work on, uh, you know, I tried to work with my renderer offshore uh, to get a better rendition of this that could explain that, that might not have been explained better in the last go round. And Amanda, I, m I imagine you could just switch to that image that I sent you earlier and reshare it at that point, because I don't think we uh, really need to go back to here unless we need to. Okay. okay, well, I'm happy to share that. What I would recommend first though is I, I'm going to share the existing condition on that side. Is that correct? Or is yeah, that okay? Yeah, you have photos? Mm -hmm. I do have the photo that you sent me today. Yes. Of the uh, existing conditions. And I think it's helpful for everyone to understand that a lot of that is still sided or is sided, not necessarily exposed log. I'm having a, a bit of a lag, so please confirm if you can see the photograph. Yes? I can see it. Thank you. Okay. So this is the area that you were looking at just a moment ago um, for the two-dimensional elevations on the right side of the building. Yeah, and we want to preserve that. You know, I mean, we're not, we, you can see how the floor is, it, the ground out there, this is a basket weave brick paver that is set in sand and it's, it, and it has definitely moved over the years. This can't be, this has a slope to it. It can't be an interior slab, but we can, um, we can replicate the, the, the material, maybe even reuse it for the floor of the new living room in the plan. And we would raise it a little bit because four steps up into the house is a little too much, but we could have two steps up into the house and we can extend this plane out to right where it's shown right here. So we're just, we're, we're, we're putting a colonnade down in front of, you know, between the extension uh, bumping off the house there and, 
and the uh, log home mass that's in the background, putting a colonnade, a glass colonnade in front of that so you can see through that. And we're removing the white screen porch in the back and replacing a new screen porch a little further out front. That's the intention. And Mom, you know, is that part of that, is that part of your calculations for the 45% or is that included as existing? Um, I don't, I don't remember how I, how I ran it, but I, I think I can check pretty quickly here. Let's see. I think I gave you 45% um, being with the footprint of the screen porch not erased from the original mass. So the original mass of the house said the screen porch was included in it and it was 2,287. And the new addition around it would be 1137. That would be 45%. If we were to remove the, I did not do a calculation, removing the screen porch from it and counting the house without the screen porch as the original and what its relationship to there would be. But you know, it would probably go over 50%, I guess, because it does okay. look like a sizable mass. Right. But not by much. Does um, anyone have any more questions or have any questions about this before I change screen? Are we able to see what it's going to look like from the Steward Street side? From the I, street? From Stewart Street. Um, I um, can pull up the renderings that, that Mr. Burke provided me today. I think that they are showing more of the side where the PALs are and less of the Stewart Street side. Oh, well, we have the Stewart Street side elevations in that same package of yeah. uh, elevations that you currently have. And I can share screen for rear photos of the house if you want to see more photos of the house. But I didn't, I didn't focus on an elevation or perspective that showed the Stewart Street side of the house uh, more because, you know, the way the house is tilted on the lot, it, you know, although this is a rear addition, it's a complete rear addition on the Stewart Street side. We don't encroach anywhere near the anywhere near the side of the house. Uh, it's on the north side that we're wrapping the addition around portion of the side. So it seemed that was the more critical in your uh, in your estimation. So I focused uh, on pushing my draftsman um, renderer to render something from that side rather than the one that was less of an issue but we can look at the elevation of it and we can, and I can get more renderings. I just can't have them for you today. Can I ask a question about this particular rendering? Let's, let's, let's wait a minute. Let's, Amanda, you, give us some overall comments on what you've heard thus far. Amanda Rose. Yes, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did speak to Mr. Burke last week um, for about an hour about this proposal and um, gave some suggestions. So what you're seeing on the screen now um, has implemented a, a couple of my suggestions. Um, I did not make recommendations related to materials. So the materials shown are, are those um, suggested by the applicant. And I believe there's one other rendering I can pull up right now. It's like an alternative. Can you see where I changed the screen or do you still see yeah. the same yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Okay, so there are a couple of different, you know, cl um, cladding configurations here. Um, my comments were really more specific to the scale and mass of the project. Um, I do have some concerns about the heaviness of the upper floor and creating a, what appears to be more of a one and a half story form on this home. Um, I do think that you know, pushing in the wall to be closer to where the current dormer is on the back would be helpful in mitigating its view shed from the street. Um, so I would ask the applicant once I've completed my portion of the presentation to maybe clarify how much that has been pushed off the wall because I believe the renderings that were provided to you ahead of time um, for this meeting show the, the this portion of the upper wall um, flush with the existing wall. The um, other comments I had were related heavily to the chimney. You can see the applicant has tried to adjust the chimney massing here. Um, it would not be appropriate to have a chimney for an addition that's more massive than the chimneys on the existing historic home. And so the applicant has um, 
sought to, to utilize more of a, a metal flue here to lessen its visibility from the street view. The, um, this is a, a unique situation in that it's not just a side addition, it's also a substantial rear addition. So I believe that's why it, it feels a bit massive. Um, and there were concerns by the committee um, last November when this came forward. Um, I would continue to recommend that the applicant um, pursue ways to, to lessen the, um, the massing. I think that this addition is more than 45% based on how the calculation would be achieved. Um, and so 50% is the recommendation by the guidelines to maintain, um, especially because this is uh, a large side addition with a rear addition and it would have visibility from the street. So um, that concludes my comments. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner, so we can talk now. Um, Kelly Baker. So I also have concerns about the mass and I think the materials that have been chosen, at least for these renderings, add to the perception of additional mass. Um, I do, you know, I, I appreciate the renderings that help us understand how the view shed um, interacts with the addition, um, but I still, I still have concern with mass and material. Okay, Susan Besser. Uh, I too also have concerns regarding the, uh, the massing of the building and um, I don't, I'm not sure I totally understand, quite frankly. And I know, Don, you spent a lot of time explaining it, but uh, I guess I need to see floor plans and that sort of thing in front of me. Uh, and so I don't really feel like I can give you a lot of feedback right now. Thank you. Brian Lester. So Don, on the shed dormer, the material proposed, is that supposed to be like a board and batten? Uh, the material I'm showing on the shed dormer was an experiment. Um, I was looking at a material called Nichiha. It's, an, it's provided by a company called Nichiha. It's kind of the next wave of uh, materials beyond uh, hardy, hardy surfacing. It's a, a little bit more expensive, but the, one of the versions that's available is a reflective surface and it comes in black or white. I just chose black for this one. Uh, and it's reflective like glass. I mean, you know, it would reflect trees and sky around it. It's almost like putting a mirror on the building in a way. So in terms of just searching for innovative solutions to throw out there to try and de-escalate the reading of mass on the building, um, you know, I know mirrors sometimes remind people of the 70s or something like that, but um, there's a long history of mirrors being used in architecture to, uh, to do a lot of interesting things. And I think in this case, it was just something to play with to say, you know, what if we put a reflective surface on there? Because this, this, tr this lot is so heavily wooded by tall trees that uh, it would catch a, a fair amount of foliage reflected back in the second level to would, would almost create the illusion that those rafters were floating in midair, that there was sky being reflected and trees being reflected in the side of it, same as the windows are shown here. Uh, I don't expect that to convince anybody, but, um, but I have seen it before and I believe it exists and works. Uh, so uh, throwing it out there for you to look at. But- um, And Don, I have another question too, it has to do, so we see the addition uh, on the back and then where the porch would be. Mm -hmm. Is that roof line appears to be above the, the main house addition. Is that just perspective? It is perspective. That is actually uh, just a few inches lower. It's a very low slung roof, uh, but that screen porch is projected out past the view, the view of the house. This is one of the things that, that was the dark gray area in the site plan that was noted as being within the view plane from the street because the screen porch would actually project one bay off of the original plane of the house. So it's sitting out proud of the, of the elevation it's in front of. Those are actually in the same plane, yeah. Uh, thank you, and my final comment would be that I, I echo the concerns of my fellow commissioners so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Lisa Marquardt. Yeah, this, this is interesting and certainly from an architectural point of view, challenging, I'm sure. Um, there, there are concerns, uh, I would say, along with uh, what has been articulated already regarding the 
the materials described that would be would tend to be reflective. I'm not sure what you called that, Nietzsche Ha. Nietzsche Ha. Yeah. yeah. You may you may start hearing about it some more. It's an innovative material. You know, it reminds me of uh, what Scott Wilson did uh, behind the uh, courthouse uh, with the addition back there, which I think was one of the most successful uh, contemporary additions to downtown uh, that I've seen uh, on display for you know the public to see. I don't know how y'all feel about it, but that scaled, that metal scaled material that was used for the addition on the back of that building. It's kind of a neat solution. This would kind of fall in the same direction. Unfortunately, no one would see it because you know it's really hidden in the back of this house. But um, I'm not sure if in, if the Binkleys are comfortable with this. I might be pushing a little too hard on it. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting material, but the the objective would be to try and erase this mass. It's just it's, it's just an attempt to kind of mitigate the massiveness of the second level that seemed to bother everybody so much. Yeah, and, yeah. And so, and, and in answer to an early question from Amanda, I did push that volume back two feet from the existing plane. And because we're looking at it in the perspective exactly that we're looking at it, it may look like it's in the same plane as that. And there's a roof plane, you know, between them, but it is actually two, receded two feet from what you would have seen in the 3D uh, in the 3D drawings that went along with this presentation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then the transparent part is the, all the glass on the lower level, you know, the renderer didn't get that right. So when, if you switch to that image, Amanda, of the down, uh, of the, the reflective one, the upper, th this is showing the existing front walls, which is what the renderer made in his model. He didn't render the interior of the building. So I'm, I'm a little miffed about this because it's not really giving you the full breadth of what that basket weave pattern floor would do extending from the inside of the house to the out. Um, it would be a lower level that felt like it was preserving the collective memory of the old screen porch for the specific house that always was there. Um, and the people who live there and remember it, you know, actually in this time frame. Um, but he, he didn't render the side of the building and the volume of the original house through there that you would see or the level or the level change is just quite right. Well, that might be helpful. And um, it seems to me a very creative way, as you have said, to preserve uh, the history of the home in a very unique kind of way. And um, uh, it, it seems to me that, that, uh, that the, the creative efforts that are going into this are almost there. Um, the, the, the renderings I think that will count the most for the commission would be uh, the front because then we would be able to see the visibility in particular of that very unusual chimney. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems certainly less massive than the other one but at the same time, we don't know what that would look like from the street view. Mm -hmm. Those would be my comments. Okay, thank you. Mary Pierce? Um, I, I think that this is, um, well, number one, I'd like to quit talking about the brick patio that's enclosed because it's not really uh, what's inside the house is really not part of our conversation. And um, so I would like to delete that conversation from further meetings. Um, I, I feel uh, that this uh, to me is, this is a really uh, almost, uh, I think we've got two uh, log homes of this period and vibe in downtown. And um, I think the massing is um, overwhelming what was there and you can't see it. And uh, I can appreciate doing some modern uh, additions I, uh, as one pointed out downtown, but it was much smaller and much uh, different situation. So I would have to see quite a few changes on the massing of this to feel like it was not an intrusion. Okay, Ken Scalf. Yes, uh, I, I understand the concept of 
divorcing yourself from the primary structure and and um, uh, not trying to compete with it. But I, I think, you know, in the historic district, I, you're going to need to use more contextual materials. I mean, I, I, I understand the concept. I think it's it's neat looking, but in the historic district, it's kind of unprecedented. Um, the chimney, uh, I, I don't know how other uh, commissioners feel about that. I have more of a comfort level with the massing, looking at your, your street side elevations perspectives at this point than I had previously. So I, I, I think that, you know, if we get the context of the, of the addition closer to what we would normally see in the historic district that, you know, I could, uh, could uh, consider this. Okay, Kathy Worthington. Um. This is the first time I've seen this. So Don, I have to commend you on pulling an addition of this uh, nature. It does tend to be massive, but I would like to see more of the drawings to digest it a little bit further. Okay, thanks. My, my, I'm concerned about the, the massing at this elevation. Um, I'm also the comment of the looking at the this chimney from the Lewisburg Avenue view is also, I would like to see that. This would also be a perfect location were we to be able to have a site visit. Uh, and that's, which really troubles me. And I talked to Amanda earlier about figuring out some way that we can start doing some site visits. However, that needs to be con constructed. I mean, I'd like to get a perspective uh, standing on either side of this house uh, from the adjacent properties um, without just walking up there as a you know, on a walk during each day uh, to, to uh, but more of an official look at, at what this thing would look like. Um, I, I think this is certainly it's certainly contemporary this this elevation um, in, in applying it to a historic home. The word reflective material is somewhat disconcerting to me because I've seen some commercial applications of reflective material and the glare off of that reflective material is significant. So I don't, I, that, this might not be the case, but I, I know in other situations with large commercial buildings where that's been a real problem when the sun hits it just right. So um, uh, other than that, I, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat like Susan Besser, which is, uh, if she doesn't understand some of this, then I sure don't understand some of this. Uh, but uh, that, that's other than this, I think it's been a it's a great attempt to try to make an addition on, on historic home. But I think we've got some more work, but the uh, work to do with it. So anyway, that's a rambling commentary. Um, May I make more comments? Yeah. Mr. Chair? So um, I do want to note that we had some elevations presented in November, and I apologize to folks who, like Ms. Worthington, who are new to the commission, didn't have access to those. I was asked not to send those out and, and really just focus on the renderings at this time. Um, all, all elevations will be required um, for this application to move forward for a formal submittal. Um, I can very much respect and empathize with both the owner and the client's um, charge here with a building that's situated this uniquely in relation to the street. Um, it, it makes it difficult to render a true rear elevation if it's not entirely behind the plane of the house. Uh, and typically that's what's encouraged. Uh, I feel more comfortable with the massing than I did when this was first uh, discussed last year. Uh, I do respect what the applicant is seeking to achieve with having a less of a, uh, a less massive feature here um, so that it doesn't, you know, have more siding or more masonry that competes with the materials of the home. I think we all can agree that the, uh, sub, the committee's recommendations would be to use more um, traditional building materials here. And um, I think that that is fair in, in keeping with the intent of the guidelines. Um, there are a lot of ways to, to lessen massing and this was one attempt that the applicant made and, and I respect that he brought that forward. Um, I as staff um, do think that the side addition is situated well. What continues to be a concern to me really is the upper level. 
I know that is something that the, the client wants to, to continue to pursue. And I certainly respect that too. What I believe is attributing and my concern is, is the near flatness of, of this slope in relation to the house. Um, I do appreciate the, the dormer being, or it's not really a dormer, it's more of an upper level at this point, um, being pushed in a couple of feet from the, um, the main wall here to help uh, lessen its visibility from the street. Um, but if there is a way to get more slope on that, so it feels more like a dormer and less like an upper level addition, I do think it would be more successful and less massive in appearance. Um, all that said, uh, the chimney um, is one that I would love to, like Ms. Marquardt pointed out, have a little bit more understanding of how it would be viewed from the street because this can be added to another side um, potentially in order to limit its visibility entirely. So for the commission and staff to feel comfortable with this, I think we would need to understand how that would look. Um, Can I have a question? You and Don Burt need to get together on the whether we're, we're talking about an addition of 45% or 53% or whatever the number is so that we're, we fully understand that. And I think there's a, uh, we're, we're not together on that. At right, present. it's it's above 45 and the number can be calculated. Mr. Okay. Burke thinks it, it would probably be over 50, but I don't, I don't expect that it's over 60. I think it's somewhere between 50 and 60. That's what I think as well. Could I could I offer a, a, an observation, a thought about how to how to how we could possibly look at this? Um, I would go back a little bit, Amanda. I, I didn't mean to to not recommend that you that you include the elevations from the previous uh, visit we had with this. My reason of it was, and also not to even not to even really talk much about this elevation was because I did want to focus on the issue of view shed. And there was a reason for that. And Carol kind of pointed it out pretty well, you know, view shed is re really what the public is going to address when they look at, at uh, a historic town, town like this. You know, if you were gonna film a movie in Franklin, you don't want to have these modern buildings stuck out in the front where you, you know, see all this stuff. But this is all happening very much in the privacy of the, back, of the backyard. So, uh, you know, to Mary's point about not being concerned about how things flow in and out of the building, when you make a wall so transparent on a building, the inside does start to actually play a part in it. And the idea that materials trans, transfer right through the house becomes part of the architecture of it. And I don't think we should, we should leave that out if, if the walls are actually transparent and say, no, no, we're just limited to the exterior elevation. If the transparency of that elevation allows you to see through to the building beyond it, you're showing that you are preserving the old building. And regardless of whether we're adding additional mass, it's in a very tracery kind of way when you fill it with glass. So, so we're making very, very special efforts to try and preserve this building exactly as it is by only removing the screen porch, but we're actually preserving the whole rear elevation. We'll be cutting an opening into that log elevation. The logs will run right through the living room. I mean, there's no better way to capture the collective memory and history of this building that's not visible from anywhere else except for the people who inhabit it or have a party in the backyard or see from the neighbor's yard into it. And I know it's not your purview to judge the interior along with the exterior, but in this case, it's a very unique case where it's not visible to the public from the outside. None of it really is. I mean, we can look at the other elevation and just you can imagine how that, how that other um, perspective from the north corner of the property shows that huge mass of fireplace. If we reduce it to a black fireplace, a black flue or a stainless steel flue or, uh, a, 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 or a galvalume one, you know, it'll, it'll fade away into the sky or into the trees, one or the other. It won't be visible from the front. So it really has to be looked at as being visible from the outside. And once you get that close to it, transparency does play a big part in the reading of the design of it, regardless of whether you're, you're, you're allowed to make a comment about it. My feeling is that as board members, you're the ones that can override what your normal guidelines are when you make a decision. That's why you're aboard, because you can you can see through something, literally see through it to where the old building is and see how we're trying to preserve it. So, so using materials that were existing to the site, reusing them, that's all part of this historic preservation, whether it runs from inside the house to out. That's better 
then that's better than saying, you know, let's peel off the whole back of the house, but just make it so small. We, we, we destroy the historic memory of the, of the log home on the inside uh, just Mr. to Burke, just make sure we would, don't would, would it be more helpful if we could just allow them to give you more comments? Sure. I, I don't want to, to eat away at your time. Okay. All right, are there any other comments from the commissioners? I, I think then I think we've covered about everything we can at this juncture. So uh, we'll just, we'll move on to the next item then, uh, which is discussion of addition at 304 Public Square. Brent, thank, I see- thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Burke. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Dinkley. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, Brent, are you in? Are you on the line? Yes, and we have uh, Jamie Dooley, the owner of the property, here with us as well. Thank you. Amanda, can you hear me? Yeah, you, I can. Go ahead. Great, perfect. Okay. Well, I think everyone's familiar with this uh, building. It's the property where Twine Graphics is currently located, right on the square. Uh, the owner has recently purchased this property and is looking to do a small addition to the rear, just enough to um, add a couple of items um, to help access to the upper level and to, to provide a restroom for the main level retail. And then upstairs, uh, an addition to convert it into a small apartment. Um, there will be no changes to the front elevation whatsoever. It will be left exactly as it sits now and um, all of the addition work will be done to the rear. Um, this diagram that's on the screen now basically just shows you on the right, you have the current footprint of what the building looks like as it sits now, main and upper level. It's about 1,200, 1,300 square feet approximately. And then the diagrams to the left, again, the existing footprints and the darker shaded area shows <clears throat> what the proposed additions might look like. We're, we're, we're maintaining those two parking spaces on the main level behind the building so the addition above will, will kind of uh, can leave out over those to create kind of a covered parking area for the cars below and then a small balcony off of the back. Um, this is a proposed main level plan showing the existing retail space as it sits currently. It's currently being used by Twine Graphics. The only bathroom in this building currently is upstairs and the employees that work there obviously have to go upstairs to use the restroom. So we're, we're providing a new restroom on the main level for them. Um, and the other addition to the back is adding um, access for the people who will be going upstairs to the apartment with an elevator and a small laundry room. The front door that goes to the upstairs will be closed off and will be just an access to the apartment upstairs off of the square. So the front double doors going into the retail space will remain. The front door going upstairs will remain. We're just going to wall that off so that the upstairs path is for the uh, users of the apartment upstairs only. Currently, that little wall there has been opened up so that the retail uh, employees can go up the stairs without having to go outside and go around to the door. We're just going to put that wall back so that it now makes that staircase a private entrance to the apartment. Um, and again, we're, we're going to maintain the two spaces in the rear. Upstairs, it just becomes a, and this is a proposed plan. We're still working things out with the owner, but this is the direction we're heading with the floor plan of the apartment upstairs. Um, a similar layout to some of the other apartments that have been done um, in, in recent years in the downtown Franklin area. Just a simple open living space and kitchen and then a, in the back a study and then a sleeping area in the balcony off of the, off the back that faces into the alleyway. Um, if you can go to the next one, please. And this is just some ideas of what it might look like from behind. We're going to stick with traditional uh, materials, um, siding and, and different applications, vertical, horizontal, iron railings, um, typical trim details that you might see. Uh, as we all know, the, the, the alleyways behind these buildings on Main Street, is, it's quite an eclectic mix of, of of things, of bricks and, and wood and lattice and, and metal and wood stairs. And, and just, it's just, it's, it's, it's an amazing mix. And it's actually quite, quite uh, interesting to see when you're driving back there, but um, there is no real cohesive aesthetic going on uh, in the alleyway behind um, any of these buildings. So 
the owner wanted to do something interesting back here with 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 their addition as a uh, as you can see, we came up with a, it's a very traditional profile. This, this, this slow curve kind of mimics the profile you might see in a molding, a, a trim or a crown molding of something inside of a home or a building. And then all of the traditional materials that you might see along the back of the alley on any other building, just, just the horizontal and vertical siding and the traditional trim, trim and casings around the windows and a simple uh, metal railing. Um, so that pretty much describes the project we um uh believe that's all that i have here I, I, if the owner if mrs dooley wants to uh add anything to that she can Ms. Dilley, do you have Dooley, do you have anything okay amanda i want to take a moment to make sure that everyone feels um comfortable understanding where this property is. So I am going to share screen. Can you bear with me just a moment? Okay. Can you see the screen with the aerial map? Not now. Okay. I think that my- You had it a minute ago. There, there you go. Okay, there it should go. There okay, so this is this is currently where Twine Graphics is located on Public Square. So you can see that building here. You can see the building cuts off here, and then the buildings on either side extend outward. I believe it's the intent of the applicant to, to line up with one of these buildings with the addition. Um, so does that help? Yeah, you had sent us some other photographs that, that probably showed it better. Yes, the, I'm having a little bit of difficulty oh, sorry. here. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the information that the applicant provided. Yeah, um, the first go. page, uh, Amanda has uh, photographs of the rear alley as it sits currently. Yes, there we right go. There, the there we right go. Mm -hmm. It's just, the, it's, um, it's helpful to see it from an aerial as well sometimes. Um, so you can see just how much short this building falls from the rest. So adding in addition to uh, to a urban um, form in, in downtown is it can be appropriate. The guidelines would recommend that they be on that ground mounted additions be at the rear, which this is. Um, there is a unique chimney here, um, which I'm hopeful will be maintained in the design. But um, my yes. comments are really more limited to the um, the profile and the material of the the new rear elevation. So I consulted with zoning. Uh, as I tend to do with projects that are uh, affected by um, more than just the design guidelines to make sure that, you know, as, as a preliminary stop for you, I, I'm able to share as much information with you as possible um, in what would be um, reviewed um, overall for a building permit. Um, in this case, this property is not only in the historic preservation overlay, but it's also in the Central Franklin overlay. On um, the Central Franklin overlay, it's clear that you know, materials should be brick, masonry, or something comparable with surrounding materials. I would suggest here um, what the design is, is kind of going for is more of a residential feel with the uh, materials and the design of the form here, like you said, more like a molding. I would actually recommend that you go more um, urban in your form and that the materials that would be most conducive to what's surrounding would actually be brick or if you are to use a frame that it would be more like the frame that you would see on the backs of buildings for for decks not that this is um, trying to be a deck per se but it is um, it really is to be treated like one um, I, I do think that um, this should be more traditional in, in shape and traditional in materials um, in order to be able to be similar to what you see in the surrounding areas and historically on the backs of buildings. This will be somewhat visible from you sheds from behind the building on Third Avenue, um, right. but not so much so. Um, it will be primarily visible to folks who are taking that alley. But I, I did want to note the material because I do think that it's the interpretation of zoning that um, this would need to be more of a um, brick or masonry to be conducive with what's around it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amanda, go back to the slide too that has the two 
uh, there you go. Oh, that one right there before. There, there you go. So you've got on the um, main floor, you're talking about 255 square foot addition with the addition to the upper floor being 517 square feet, which shows, and then plus that balcony is what I'm saying. It, is that? Uh, that's accurate, yes. Okay, all right. All right, let's let's go to the commissioners for comments. Uh, hey, Mr. Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah. May may I offer a little history on this building before we take comments? Okay. Uh, many people know this building as the Darby Building. The Darbys had owned it since uh, about 1983-82. But actually, this is the most unique building, actually in the downtown area. Uh, it actually, so we know that Abram Murray is the founder of Franklin. His nephew bought this lot in 1816 and built this building in 1817. Hmm. This year, this building will celebrate its 204th anniversary. And there's not another building in downtown Franklin, at least in, within the, the commercial area that can make that claim. It's also very unique in its roof structure because it has more of a gable form with a shed on the back. Uh, also, it hasn't been altered in any way that I know of in 204 years. Uh, the chimney that's on the back and the windows form a character that's unique to anything that we have downtown Franklin. And I would, I would have to pause to allow to vote for anything that would alter this building in its unique character. Okay, that's interesting. Um, all right, Kelly. Well, thank you, Brian, for that. I always appreciate the history that you provide um, our commission. Um, just echoing a lot of what Amanda had to say, um, this of course is an impact the front, so that's very valuable, but as far as design goes, I would prefer to see something much more traditional um, than what's been presented. Okay, Susan Besser. Um, I do appreciate Brian's um, input into this. That was very helpful. And I, I would have to say that I would prefer to see something more traditional uh, on the back. Thank you. Okay, any more comments, Brian? That's it, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, Lisa? The, uh, the the I the mass on that uh, balcony is is uh, striking, and I, I don't think that there's anything like it uh, that makes it um, consistent with the surrounding buildings. Even though it is in the back, I know our focus is on the front, but nevertheless. Um, that that would be quite a shift in design for even that hodgepodge back there, as described by the applicant. Um, uh, this this isn't architectural language, but uh, a petite balcony that's uh, considerably smaller and more traditional, simpler. Uh, might be something uh, less intrusive, but even then, uh, it doesn't seem consistent with the the rest of the the buildings back there. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Um, well, this is our our oldest building, and um, the roof is is different for a reason. And I think if the addition could somehow respect that roof form and um, then just uh, the other comments that people have said about the, um, the, the roof, the, the whole addition, how it reads is very um, contemporary and eye-catching, would like to see that become uh, everything that everybody said, the staff. So that's it. 
Thank you, Ken. Ken Scow. Yes. Uh, so I, I don't know. He did not describe the materials being used here, but it looks like a T111 type siding, which there's plenty of that in the alleyway that is in really bad shape. Um, I, you know, with the history of the building and so forth, I, I think this would have to be done in a manner that it could be removed without any impact on the original structure. And the, the plane of the upper facade, where is that in relationship to the adjacent facades on the back? Brent, can you comment on that? Yes, if you will look at, let me see what slide that is, and I'll, I'll refer you to it. I believe it's going to be slide number five, Amanda. Where there, where the two cars are shown in the covered parking area, there's a there's a dashed line okay. above the cars. That shows you the extent of the of the exterior wall above at the second level. Is that the question? Is that what you were asking? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that it it is the 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 perspective or the elevation uh, that you showed really I don't think shows the depth of this because this is completely covered parking with a wheel stop and what appears to be about a sidewalk depth between that, that lower facade and the parking. Um, so it's it it's interesting, but I think uh, you need to take your cues from, from the existing facades back there that are, that are existing um, uh, back to an original state that they haven't been modified and manipulated there's a lot of that in, in that alley it's it's unfortunately it's pretty unkept in some areas but i, I yeah that the, that the wood siding and the uh the cedar look um, um shingle um I, I don't think it's appropriate in this situation you're you're right it is quite a quite a kludge of, uh, of of building materials on that back alleyway it's 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 from one building to the next you know you never know what you're gonna gonna see Kathy Worthington. I don't have anything to add in, in addition. Again, this is another one, my first time looking at it, so I would need time to digest it further. And Brent, I don't have any, I don't have any comments other than what's already been expressed. So thanks, thanks, Amanda, do you have anything else to add? Do you? I, I want to thank Mr. Scal for his comment about um, understanding how the addition is being tied to the, the existing so it could be removed in the future without consequence to the existing. Um, I am not going to recommend against a rear addition. I completely um, respect what Mr. Laster said, but I, I do understand that our guidelines would support buildings being, you know, man, managing growth and change over time. And I think as a good compromise to that would be understanding how that, that rear uh, elevation is being manipulated to accommodate the addition. Um, I'd also like a roof plan. I think that would be helpful. And then if you could do a 2D rendering, or not a 2D rendering, a 2D drawing that shows what Mr. Scalf was getting at, how how far this, uh, this addition um, extends out from the existing back walls on either side of it. Um, I, I don't know that it does, but I want to understand the relationship um, of the proposed addition and covered parking to what's on either side from a, a two-dimensional. Um, it's almost a, a, sec a section cut through the back half of the building exactly. showing each of the adjacent buildings and how far it projects. Yeah, that exactly. makes sense. It wouldn't have to be very, very uh, fancy at all. Just something I think that would help everyone really grasp the, uh, that, the that's intent a great of the suggestion. proposal. Yeah, that, that's absolutely good. Well, that, that, that sounds like a good idea. Good idea. And and even some photos uh, would also be helpful of the context. And yes, yes, we can uh, certainly uh, yeah. work on that. Yes, uh, I think, okay. I, I think what you're doing. Trip. I think what you're doing can be very, very much supported by staff if it were to be designed in a way that it it reads a little bit more like. Uh, what you typically see on the back. And I, I know to, to some, some of the folks' points, um, these are rear elevations and they may not be quite as capped as the front would be. Um, but I am thinking more of designing it more like a deck that's that's 
screened on top as opposed to um, a balcony. I, it would serve as a balcony and it would serve as covered parking, but it would read more like what you would traditionally see in an alley setting, um, if that makes sense. That makes okay, sense, anything yes. else? Anything else? Other, otherwise, I think, and thank you, Brent. Yes, sir. Um, I yeah. think we need a motion to adjourn then. Unless somebody else has, oh, we have another meeting next Monday. Uh, Amanda, you want to remind I, everybody about that? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. We do have a meeting on Monday at the 22nd. I believe it's the 22nd. Let me double check. Yes, Monday the 22nd at 4.30 p.m. We will be discussing the... Um, we not we are not discussing the design guidelines update this month, but we are discussing the new city hall facility design and historical context for um, how that design um, is being envisioned. This is not a um, a plan that shows a design for this site by any means. We're nowhere near that. <laughs> this is more of um, the consultant providing a presentation on the historical context of this property and getting ideas from this subcommittee on how to move forward. Um, this will be the first uh, committee within the city structure to be reviewing this project publicly. Uh, it is uh, very important to the city team and the consultants to engage the Historic Zoning Commission's Design Review Committee early on to get that feedback to move forward. Um, if you have any questions for me, feel free to extend those. I will be sending you something either Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning um, that is a copy of the applicant's presentation. And uh, look forward to, uh, I've seen it, I've heard it. Um, the, it's a great team and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Okay, thank you. Then I need a motion to adjourn, if nothing else. So moved. Thank you, Mary. Second. Second. <laughs> Second. Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. All right, mm -hmm. Kelly Baker. Aye. Susan Besser. Aye. Brian Laster. Aye. Uh, Lisa Marquardt. Aye. Mary Pierce. Aye. Ken Scalf. Aye. Kathy Worthington. Aye. And Jim Roberts. Aye. See everybody. Thank you, and we'll see everybody next Monday afternoon. Thank you very Thank much. You.